warm welcome to, to everyone to this inclusive line management webinar. Um, I'm Julia Hobart, I'm partner at Oliver Wyman. And, and last year with Jane Welsh, who, who will appear a bit later, I co-led some research that the Diversity Project did on the importance of line management in creating an inclusive culture. And I'm very lucky today to be joined by uh, a very well qualified panel who can and will share their experiences and thoughts on, on the topic. Um, I'll quickly introduce them now. Uh, Mitte Sheth, the CEO of Reddington, Paul Sampson, partner at Allen and Overy, uh, Vanessa Barrett, uh, Associate Director at Wellington Management. And, and uh, as I'm in, alluded, I, I will get them to properly introduce themselves in a minute. Um, one housekeeping point, um, you're, we're all veterans now of Zoom, um, but if you want to put in questions, please do that on the Q&A button. And if you want to make suggestions and make comments, please put that on the chat button and we'll capture that um, during the course of, of the session. Uh, we will have um, probably two spots for Q&A, uh, which we'll pick up one after the sort of intros uh, and one towards the end. So please do keep put, putting in the, the questions. So a bit of the background to this, um, I think we've probably everyone on this call has, or this, this webinar has, has been involved with DNI for quite some time. And, and it's a bit frustrating that progress has been quite limited. And that's what prompted the research that we did last year. Um, thinking that line management actually would be one of the critical components to help to unlock it, um, such as uh, the selection of line managers, training, assessment rewards, support, um, et cetera, and actually probably the attitude to line management itself. Um, so in the work that we did, there was, uh, and maybe unsurprisingly, pretty well universal agreement that line management was pretty critical in creating an inclusive culture uh, and indeed a, a, a conducive environment. Um, but the study did conclude that in most cases, there was quite a lot of work still to be done to, to make sure that people were being made line managers for the right reasons, that they were given the right tools to do the job and were supported. And, and quite importantly, there was alignment between what they were being asked to do, how it was being measured and how they were being rewarded. Um, it is a bit disappointing that there appears to be relatively little progress so far, and that may be because of COVID, of course. Um, but what we wanted to do in this session was to get some real enthusiasts to the cause, um, to get you excited about it, to, and perhaps to give some really practical pointers, things that you can do tomorrow, starting tomorrow. Um, and that's really where we wanted to, to, to take this session. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to the panelists um, and really ask them to talk for a brief intro, you know, up to five minutes of what they believe to be the, the, the sort of role that um, line managers can play in creating an inclusive culture. And then we'll turn to more specific questions in a moment. So firstly, um, for you, Mitesh, um, you were hugely helpful in the research that we did, but not only that, you actually put it, started putting it into practice, which was fantastic. And in fact, created a questionnaire, which you put to your line managers, which we have shamelessly adopted. Um, and, and maybe something that people wouldn't know about you is that uh, uh, early in your career, or maybe before your real career, you, you trained to be an actor with the National Youth Theatre, and then you turned to the dark side and became an actuary. So with that, I'll hand over and look forward to hearing from you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Julia. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. I think this is a really important conversation we're having this morning around the role of line management in creating and fostering in inclusive cultures. So I became CEO at Reddington just five years ago, and culture was a key strategic priority for me particularly around increasing the diversity in our organization and critically an environment where that diversity could speak up, could thrive and could succeed. Um, what became really clear to me early on 
was that line managers have a huge influence on the culture experienced by employees. And if I was going to have any success in making that shift, it would have to be through a collective conversation and dialogue with those line managers. Uh, so I'll keep it to there now, Julia, happy to come back and talk later about the, 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 the paper and, and how we shared that with, with the team and the kind of takeaways from that. Brilliant. Thank, thanks so much. I'll, I'll turn to Vanessa next. Um, and what's really interesting about Wellington um, is that you have a different approach to line management. Um, so very interested to hear from you, um, what you, how you do it at Wellington. Mm -hmm. um, you are a full-time manager, so that makes you a little bit different. <clears throat> but also, if you can explain a bit, either now or later, what you've done and, and maybe what the challenges are. Yeah, no, thank you, Julia, and, and good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, so I, my role at Wellington on the tin, it says I'm an investment director on the, on the uh, sorry, I'm an associate director on the investment platform. But what that really means in plain English is that I'm a line manager for a number of our investors um, here in London. So when we speak about or we talk about investors in London, uh, investors at Wellington, uh, we mean portfolio managers, our team analysts, credit and equity analysts, as well as our strategists. So I have direct line management responsibilities for our early career investors. And that's our investors that have anywhere from zero to seven, maybe 10 years experience. And then I also have matrix uh, management responsibility for our more senior um, investors um, in our investment teams, research team, and also in investment science. And so from my perspective, um, it really helps me bringing those two different groups together. Um, if we think about our early career investors, um, they're a different generation uh, to me. Um, they are the future of the firm and more broadly, the future kind of of this industry. So it's really critical um, that they are heard, um, that, they're under, that they're understood and their views and opinions um, really matter. And, you know, I love working with them. I, I learn from them every single day. Um, they have different values, different goals, different aspirations. Um, and it really helps me um, stay connected to kind of what is the future of this industry. So then in my role, um, I map my work with the early career investors to the work that I do with the senior investors at Wellington and the other directors like myself who are dedicated line managers on the investment platform. And so we think more holistically when working with the senior investors, what their resourcing needs are. So it could be anything from succession planning, and we can talk a little bit about that further on, to the more tactical and practical day-to-day -day work. So what are their resource needs? Are they growing their book of business? Is it shrinking? Is it becoming more or less complex? Is this a, really a, going to be a true alpha opportunity for our clients going forward? And within that context, we think about pivoting talent, right? So, um, and as we pivot talent, does this present an opportunity for our diverse talent, particularly our early career investors? Um, and, and do they have the skills right now? Or will they have the skills in five, seven, 10 years when we want to pivot them to a, a role? And what do we need to do now to get them in that um, position? So this is really what we do as directors on the investment platform as dedicated line managers. All we do is think about talent and the business, what the talent is right now and where the business is right now, uh, where we, what the talent looks like in the medium term, what we want the business to look like in the medium term, and then take also a, a long-term horizon. So what do we envisage the investment platform to look like in 10 years time? And how do we map the current talent and the future talent um, to get there? So there are really you know, kind of three elements, like a tactical, practical, and also a strategic element um, to my role. And it firmly centers around investment talent. So that's all we do as a leadership team is really focus on the investment talent, um, give them the support, training, coaching, and all the resources that they need um, to be um, as impactful and successful um, for our clients. Fantastic. Well, um, we'll explore some of those points in a second. Let, let me now turn to you, Paul, last but by no means least, um, partner at Allen Overy. So you, you actually are from a different part of the professional industry. Um, and and we, we thought that that and what you do at Allen Overy will, would be really interesting. You are a full-time lawyer. So this, this is not your, you know, line management is not your thing specifically, but it's very interesting to hear. And as I understand it, you, you have less about um, line management and as, as an organization 
um, and more on sponsorship. So we will we'll cover that at some point too. Um, the other thing about Paul, which is which uh, I, I discover is that since COVID, he has become a LinkedIn blogger with uh, with quite a following. So you can probably find him there if, if you want later. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, thanks, Julia. And uh, yeah, uh, difficult to follow uh, Mitesh and Vanessa after that, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, I, I'm, I'm a partner in the uh, London Funds and Asset Management team in London at, at a and um, and um, I suppose being being a partner is, is in a law firm is quite an odd job because in, in many ways you're sort of required to do a bit of everything. So we, we sort of lead, lead we lead on the execution of the work and the, and the, I suppose the the winning of the work, but we're also responsible for um, you know amongst other things nurturing talent and actually you know that's a that's a really important part of the job. So although Although line management per se is not something you you really hear in a law firm as a as a as a phrase, or at least amongst sort of fee earners, the idea that senior people within the organisation are responsible for bringing through the next generation is absolutely essential to uh, to law firms and, and frankly any any partnership which is constantly evolving and 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 making sure that it survives um, um for sort of future generations and i think you know we've looked at our own organization and it and it's you know it's no secret that within our organization and also the legal profession generally there is a uh that you know the, the stats don't lie there is the, the, the law firms are run by essentially uh white men and so there's a real focus within my firm and and within you know our, our peers to improve um, the diversity of the organisation, both in terms of, of sort of gender, which frankly always slightly annoys me as to why gender even becomes a diversity issue when half the planet is a female, um, uh, and uh, but also in terms of accessing what I would you know refer to as non traditional backgrounds you know uh, from uh, away from the sort of normal universities that one would traditionally recruit from um, and, and opening up the profession to people to, that don't have those opportunities and we can we can come on to that later but I, I suppose one comment I'd like to make is that I actually don't like the term line manager uh, and because I to me it implies something almost patriarchal and it kind of represents to me, and I'm interested to hear the other panelists' views. But it, it sort of represents to me almost someone who who it could could you know inhibit or block talent because you're sort of interposing interposing that person between um, you know up and coming juniors and and senior management. Um, and so I think it's really important to. I suppose distinguish between what we really mean by, or, or kind of articulate what we mean by line management. And in in, in our organisation, we think of it more around sponsorship. And and I think Julia, we're going to come on to that later. But for me, whatever you call the person, um, you know, who has that responsibility, it's really about putting your rep, putting your reputation on the line for your protege essentially that's the way i look at it people may have different views and, and taking responsibility for his or her promotion and, and advancement within the organization and i think you know line managers they play an essential role because they're often uh they're they're often not the most senior people in an organization so they provide a critical link between junior talent and that senior management who you know um, perhaps not in Mitesh's case, who seems to be doing everything, but in, in many in many organisations, you know that that those those really senior people perhaps don't spot or have the time to 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 really nurture that that junior talent. And so, I think line managers have a critical role to play. They're they're often part of a sort of slightly you know as as, as Vanessa alluded to a slightly younger generation, and therefore less fixed in their mindsets and can see the value of, of you know DNI, for instance. Um, you know, my own career. I'm 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 a DNI ally partner. I'm I'm sort of I head up our banking uh, pro bono and community initiatives, uh, uh, and and so roles like that are tend to be bestowed on 
uh, more junior partners of, of which I'm I'm one of. And so I think you know to to we we are actually more incentivized to ensure that the organization moves forward and and that in part means you know focusing on recruitment from a more diverse pool and ensuring that people from non-traditional backgrounds have the same opportunities as you know what has historically been a sort of mini me type approach where people are promoted and championed in their in in, in their own image and and you know we can talk about that later as to why that 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 trend occurs but you know that's something a and o that we're, we're we're trying to really address head on thank thanks very much paul and i i'm intrigued because actually i thought about it too the, the term line management um maybe maybe people would like to contribute in the chat function to their view of whether line management is appropriate or annoying um and whether there are better terms um i i wonder one of the things that you've each alluded to is what role, <laughs> what, 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 how the, the line, I'm going to use it in, in absence of, of another term, what role the line manager can play in career progression, whether there is something that needs to sit behind whether you're full-time or part-time, um, to make sure that, that everyone has the opportunities that, that for each of them to fulfill their potential, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're not trying to make everyone CEO, but we are trying to get everyone to, to reach their potential. Um, I don't know if any of you would particularly like to start with that. Paul, I know you've, you've, you've views, views on. on. Oh, oh we're, we're, we've got, we've got feedback. feedback. Let me go on mute. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to say that one, Julia, if people aren't fed up of hearing from me already, but. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So, so, so as I said, we're we're sort of we're we're responsible for you know as as partners, one is responsible for spotting talent at a very early stage. And so, I'm involved in you know trainee recruitment, and you know the, the legal profession has a slightly different model to probably many people on the call. But just by very brief background, trainees they they sit in you know tends to be four different departments for six months each before qualifying into a particular group. And so from a very early stage, you're, you're sort of recruiting people as trainees. And then, and then as they rotate through the groups, you are trying to spot, you know, the future, I suppose, the you know, the future, uh, the future talent. And, and, and it's not, it's not that you're trying to spot a future partner because not everyone wants to be a partner. And, you know, as we, as our business evolves from being a law firm, traditionally to a legal services provider, all sorts of other career paths are, are cropping up. And I think actually a real, a real important role that line managers can play is, is a selfless one, whereby it's not just about, um, you know, what can this person sort of do for me? And then if they do something for me, I'll help them. It's actually allowing um, junior people to find out what they are good at, where their interests are, what work they want to do, and that might actually involve, you know, helping them find a different role within the organization or or even, you know, in our case, joining a joining a client or, you know, or moving, moving sort of in, in house. Um, and, you know, McKinsey are particularly good at this. They 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 don't expect people to stay in their organization for years on end. Um, and actually, they get a load of business from from sort of uh sending their people out into the world and, and joining other organizations and then those people come back to use to, to use mckinsey and so that that model is is quite an interesting one um and I, and I don't think you know a true line manager a true sponsor is someone who allows an individual to to thrive but also doesn't sort of hold that individual back for himself or herself because you know i, I found in my own career that you you invest in individuals and uh, you know, invest time and energy in them. And then um, they may turn around and say, actually, you know, I, I'm sort of, this isn't for me, this career path, and I, I'd like to do something else. And you have to sort of, you have to let them go. You have to let them find their own way. You, you can't, you can't approach line management as, or sponsorship as, as what, you know, as something that is, it, you're going to get something out of. If, 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 to be a true sponsor, you really have to, encourage people to come out of their comfort zone, 
you have to give them clarity on the skills and knowledge and expertise they need to progress you know through ongoing feedback etc you need to be having regular conversations with them um and and actually i don't know what it's like for other people on this call but in the legal profession people are very bad at giving feedback you know we generally we generally sort of uh you know uh, we, we don't we find it difficult to give negative feed, negative um feedback and we're not very good at thanking people either and so i think you know part of being a good line manager is just having a much more open and honest uh, relationship and uh, i think the other thing i'd say julia is that it's about sharing the stage with people you know you you'll find if you're a good line manager, if you've done a really good job, the day will come where the person you've managed suddenly is better than you at something. <laughs> and that's really your objective. And, 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 and if, you, if they're not better at you at something, you've failed them. And the day that comes, and when they, when they sort of are showing you up in a, in a meeting or in front of a client or whatever it is, um, that's a difficult moment. And you have, to, you have to share the stage with them and you have to let them, um, you know, uh, I suppose show their quality and, and and not hold them back, and I think that's I think that's a really important thing to recognise that if 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 you've not achieved that, then you've you've done something what you've done something wrong in my book. And and actually on on exactly that note, Mitesh, I'm I'm going to turn to you because you I know you hold regular workshops. You're you're very good at, as an organisation uh, at, at sharing the stage, so to speak. Um, uh, and I, I wonder whether, uh, and you can weave this in if you wish, whether the, it's the sort of the middle level that in a way is the most sensitive. You know, yes, we, we should definitely nurture the, 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 the people just coming in, but it's actually in the middle level where they sometimes get neglected and where it becomes even more important to, to make sure we're nurturing them too. But, but Mitesh, I don't know if, you, if you'd like to, Sure, really happy to. Um, and, and maybe I'll just touch on what, what you and Paul said earlier around the definition of line management and so on. So I thought a lot about this and, and we don't use the term line manager, but you know, what was thinking about really what is it that we wanted to do at Reddington? We, did we want our line managers to be the information brokers? We decided no. So the communication from me and the leadership team goes to the whole firm at the same time. So we don't cascade through you know, hierarchy. Um, similarly, we wanted people to be able to raise their voice and not have to channel ideas through their managers. So again, that's a role that we made you know, our line management just redundant for, our managers redundant for. But we said managers need to do five specific things and we actually gathered all our managers. And that, again, we made the decision to not have hierarchies here. So whether you're managing you know, a junior person, 10 junior people, the graduates, all the way through to senior senior managers, we got them all in a room. I think it was January 2017. And we said, what do we want to be held accountable to? What is our role as line managers in this organization? And we came up with five things. My manager, and we said, what should our people expect from us? Let's make a really clear, this kind of implicit psychological contract, crystal clear. And then we shared that with the whole organization. And we seek anonymous feedback from the firm every quarter on how are we doing against that commitment we've made to you. Um, so that's a workshop I, you, you were referring to. So that number one is my manager holds me accountable for my objectives. Number two is my manager provides the resources and environment for me to succeed. Number three, my manager is interested in my career development, my success and well-being. Number four, my manager seeks to understand me as an in individual which is really around inclusion. Number five, my manager not only gives me actionable feedback, but asks for it too. Um, and I think that's been really clear. Our managers um, for, have found it really valuable to be clear about what we expect from them, to know that we're gathering anonymous feedback against that and sharing that with the whole group. We're looking to learn from those who are doing it really well and asking them, why are you doing, you know, why are you getting such good feedback on how you can hold people accountable or how you seek to understand people as an individual or career development and having them share with each other. Um, all the way through to critically that feeding into our pay and promotions process as, as important data by which we'll judge the success of largely player managers, much like Paul has in his organization. Um, 
So I guess that's it. What I found when you shared your paper with us was it was really interesting because I, I remember saying to you that this is, I think this is such an important topic. I think in creating an inclusive, inclusive culture absolutely rests on the shoulders, not just of executive leadership or board, but with the middle management, with anyone who manages anyone. That's where the multiplier happens. Um, and when I, you know, when we shared your paper and the survey with that group of the entire group of people managers in the firm, their response was, we think Reddington's committed to creating a collaborative, a, a, an inclusive culture, uh, you know, and, and, and that our role is critical to that. And I feel supported to do that. But there were three things we, they thought we could do better. And, and, and that's been a really important kind of illumination that we've focused on. So number one was external training isn't as helpful and often less targeted or relevant. What we'd rather do is have our peers, the other line managers with more experience or who are doing better than us, sharing with us what they're doing well, because they get all the context. So we've changed that so, so that we can make that happen. The second was we'd love the opportunity to, you know, to learn from each other and to have a safe space where we can say, I'm struggling with this. How can, you know, how can I be better at it? So again, we've created spaces for people to do that in smaller groups amongst other line managers. And the third was, I'd really like the, the link between good people management to be clearer in how that feeds through into objectives and reward, which again, we've done as a result of that. So I found the paper you wrote and the application of that to the structure we had already created kind of really valuable uh, when we did that a few months ago. Fantastic. Um, um, <laughs> Jane, I, and by the way, Jane, um, who, who is going to appear, <laughs> is my, is the co, co um, writer of the paper. So, um, do, do, do you, other questions? I, I there's, saw there's a some couple really, on here. There's some really good questions. I mean, Mitesh may have already answered the first one, which is around how can we measure how inclusive line management is, but it might be good to hear from from the other panelists as to if they've got any ideas on that? Maybe Vanessa, given that, that you, you're very close to this. Could, could you give the chance? Yeah, some... just trying to un un unmute here. Yeah, so I think, so I, I broadly, you know, the what Paul spoke about and Mitesh spoke about really kind of resonates with how we think about management or people or talent management um, at Wellington. and. At a high level, I think, you know, we all agree that for our talent to be at their best and to be happy and perform, um, they need to be, be motivated. And, and however you want to describe how somebody is motivated, they need to be recognized, rewarded, and really feel like they belong. Um, so in addition to the, you know, the strategic element and, and the process element of line management, I'm going to use that term because I don't have a better term right now. Um, critical, I think, to, main, to, to, to helping manage talent um, is to create this environment of inclusion, inclusion and, and belonging. And I think that really sits and needs to lead, well, frankly, it sits with everybody in the organization, but I think line managers have to lead by example. Um, I think this is true for all organizations, not just in, in our industry. Um, and for us, what, what does that really look like in practice? I think, it, it, you know, for me, it's, it's getting down in the trenches, like really getting your hands dirty, rolling your sleeves up. Um, and, it, and, and it's hard. And, and, you know, player managers have time constraints. Um, we all have time constraints. Um, but I think the, 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 easy, the, the more you know your individuals and oh, your team members, like really know them, what motivates them, um, what their values are, what their experiences are, what their accomplishments are, what their aspirations are and how they have changed over time, then you're better informed on what, um, where, that, where that individual can um, contribute to the organisation and, and have a feeling of belonging. Um, so when we think about an individual's career aspirations as they change, um, if they want to learn a new skill or work in a different part of the business, as Paul talked about that, that McKinsey does or other organisations do, uh, I think we can provide that objectivity and that independent external advocate and ally. Um, we take the example, and Paul really much alluded to it. Um, we have a PM team. We have an analyst that's been with a team for five years. Um, you know, that investor has invested a lot of time coaching and developing that talent. Um, that, that individual team analyst wants to explore other parts of the business. Maybe they don't feel like their career trajectory um, is going in a path that they want. 
And so the role I think of that we play as people managers is to identify that and take out an element of the awkwardness and that, that bias um, that is often embedded within smaller teams uh, and have an open um, conversation about it. And ultimately what is the best outcome for our individual, for the team and ultimately um, for our clients. I also I think, thought, sorry, 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 Jane. sorry. I, sorry, I was Jane. just going to ask though, where, and, and you might not want to be put on the spot, but, but in terms of performance evaluation and reward mm. for, for this role, how, how easily <laughs> is that done? Because I think that was behind the question as well. Yeah, I, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off. Yeah, no, that, you're right. Um, so I think it's a much more qualitative and longer feedback cycle in this, in, in this role. And I think when you come into this role, you have to be open and mindful of that. Um, you know, that we talk about succession planning, that's a multi-year cycle, right? So I think as, as a line manager in this role, you have to be prepared for the incremental results over time. And you've got to be really comfortable with the ambiguity that comes around that. Um, as close as we get to quantitative measurements at Wellington is a manager capability um, survey. And that's a survey um, that um, all our direct reports fill out on, on a, it's a scale of one to 10. And then we uh, comped against all the other managers. So it's a relative quantitative scale on, on how you perform as, as a manager. And, and there's around about, I think, 50 to 60 questions within that um, survey. So it's quite a robust survey. So that's probably the most quantitative element that we have. Um, and then it's around the, the feedback from your direct reports. And I think where the critical difference is, is not about always saying yes and telling everyone how great they are. I think it's about being prepared to have the, the tough conversations. Um, and that, and because that really helps individuals grow and develop and learn, right. Um, and I think and it's also much more tangible and visible when you have a, you know, a relatively harder conversation and you can see the talent inflect and grow and, and, and develop. I think with respect to kind of um, the our DE and I initiatives in particular at Wellington, there is, you know, um, Mitesh talked about this, accountability and ownership. Um, the directors on the platform have, have very specific um, accountability and ownership around our DE and I objectives. So hiring, what does the slate look like? Is it a diverse slate? Um, for our development plans, for our diverse talent and all our talent, are the plans tailored and actionable to each individual? Um, and every year we present those development plans to our regional um, committees, that's head of the office, head of HR and other senior, um, senior people at the firm to really talk about individual talent. So what that does is we have a, a development plan, but it also keeps us accountable. And it also flags to um, senior, senior people in the firm, the diverse talent that we have coming up um, in the pipeline. And then of course, there's the direct feedback um, that we get from our teams about concrete examples where you have demonstrated inclusivity um, and, 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 and which leads hopefully to that feeling of belonging. Um, I will finish on this point and say at Wellington, it is a um, recognized leadership career track. Um, the, the directors on the platform are partners of the firm. Um, the, each of the, the leads of the individual um, circles, as we call them within the investment platform, are partners of the firm. The head of our London office is a director um, on the investment platform and, and has um, people management responsibilities, and he is also um, a partner of the firm. So it is a recognizable career track at Wellington. I hope that answers the question. Uh, that's Julia. fantastic. And, and uh, it's such an important point. And I think that status point it, it has come up in different guises. Um, and really, really good to know that actually it isn't a subsidiary track. Uh, Jane, are there any other questions that we could, we should capture? Well, we've we've talked about the how we how firms can recognise and reward inclusive leadership, but there is a sort of subsidiary question about should we be penalising bad practice, ex, you know, penalising exclusive leadership? Is is that something that uh, we could cover? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to cover that, Jane. I think um, it's difficult it's difficult to come up with a model. Uh, you know, you're talking about the sort of the carrot and the stick. Um, and I think the carrot always works better than the stick. Having said that, people tend to be quite stuck in their ways and so need an occasional beating with a stick to sort of change their behaviours. 
And, and part of that is, and I, I'm not one for quotas uh, personally, and, and that's a whole nother topic, but I'm certainly one for targets um, and because targets are measurable um, and they don't create the feeling of, um, uh, well, they, they create an incentive on leaders to meet those targets with, and failure to do so should lead to consequences. Now we can debate what those consequences should be, but to my mind, there's, a, there's often a disconnect between the macro and the micro. So it's all very well having policies in place, having senior, you know, um, senior leadership talking about the need for uh, you know, diversity, inclusion and, and, ta and, and, and retention of talent, etc. But unless that's filtering down to sort of on, on the ground level, then you're never going to achieve anything. Um, you, you're just going to have a series of policies on an intranet and you're going to have a series of articles that are out there to the rest of the world talking about the wonderful things you have in place. But if the experience of the individual on the ground is still a one where by they feel that, you know, all the opportunities, all the promotions, et cetera, are going to the same old faces, then you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. So, you know, it, it, in my firm, um, there are, there are sort of, there, there are much now clearer targets about what, uh, about, you know, the pipeline and who's coming through, you know, we have to spot talent much earlier and we have to explain to management how we are, what we are doing to retain that talent and make sure it comes through from all, all backgrounds, not, not just, you know, not just uh, sort of diverse ones. Um, and, 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 you know, if, if, if the same old faces are, are coming through that system, then there are there are consequences for that, and you know we've been told very clearly that you know we that it will be considered a failure um, in each of our groups if if we, we if we are not addressing the very the very clear problem. Um, now I think you need to be careful because you don't want to create a situation where sort of people are living in fear or or, or they're incentivized to promote people for the wrong reason. Fundamentally, people want to be promoted. Um, for their talent and, and, and nothing else, um, and that's that's my experience. Um, uh, but but, e but equally equally, if and I'll hand over to Mitesh. But e equally, if you if you don't have some sort of measurable uh, target or, or quota, or whatever it is, then you have nothing to report against. And if you're not reporting, there's no way of tracking it. So so you you, you do need you do need to create those. Uh, tangible incentives for people to change behaviors. I think I think that's spot on. And I think for us, what we found is that by having really clear criteria, of what do we expect from a manager? Um, and I think it's a, it's a real spectrum, isn't it? By just having everyone be player managers versus, I guess, at Vanessa's world where you've got a dedicated management track, where I assume if your managers aren't creating and building an inclusive culture, they're not going to perform well. They're not going to progress in that track. I think we find ourselves somewhere in the middle there where we make it clear that you don't have to be a manager to succeed in the firm. So we have role models in the firm who have been kind of, you know, client consultants, researchers, analysts, et cetera, and also manage people. We've also had others who don't manage people who've been equally successful. And I think that's been important. But I do think um, it's getting the difference between when it comes to carrots and stick, focusing the stick and all the encouragement at the inputs level, by the time you figure out that you haven't got a diverse group of people coming through your pipeline, it's too late. Um, you've got to focus on the inputs. How many of your, you know, how are you doing with your CVs? How are you doing with your recruitment? What are you doing in your day to day that's actually encouraging diverse talent and fundamentally that diverse talent to thrive and succeed? And I think if people don't get it and, and don't kind of, uh, you know, deliver against those objectives, you have to be having a performance conversation with them, or maybe a behavior conversation with them, uh, very, very tied into to, to the people team. And we certainly did have done that in our firms. I think it's really important that that this has teeth uh, as much as it would if you weren't, you know, delivering winning a client account or delivering the performance that, that is expected. So I think it's got to have the same weight for it to be treated as seriously. That 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 sounds <laughs> so sensible, and, and and in lots of ways, yeah. Why why couldn't we have thought of that ourselves? But 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 you know, it, it's it's nice, lovely to see that you put, you're putting it into practice. Um, Jane, I don't know if there are other questions. I I have I have one 
here that that I'd like to put to um, any of you, all of you, um, which is what are the in initiatives you've you've used you put in place which may not have worked out as you'd anticipated, and what did you do to redirect? I don't know if anyone would like to jump in on that. Mitesh. I don't know. I would, I'd love to hear from Vanessa on that. Actually, I was going to, if she didn't mind me putting on the spot, because um, it's such a fascinating um, kind of example and pretty rare in our industry. Yeah, I mean, um, so I think there there are a number of things that uh, we've tried it and it doesn't work. I think uh, first and foremost, I think what um, when we think about the the role of the directors at, at Wellington uh, as people managers, I think making it local. I think that's. First and foremost, so historically we have had uh, line managers that manage um, investors here in London that are based in Boston, and I think what that that I think what ha, what we have seen there, what we've had experienced there, is is, is just um, the the process part of people managing is managed fine, but it's really the the second and third levels below that, um, and really understanding the talent and being on the ground and getting feedback. And I think, you know, we, as we prepped for this, there's a discussion around COVID and how COVID has impacted line management and what we need to do. And, and, and as I was thinking about that, it, it kind of echoed back to how we're thinking about line managers being offshore or not near um, the talent. So I think that's, you know, certainly one aspect that we've learned at, at Wellington is having local managers is really, really important. Not only um, to understand the talent, but to, 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 to really unwrap how they're feeling, how they're interacting, getting the serendipitous feedback from um, the, the, the people that they work with. Um, I think that's an invaluable um, tool. I think um, where we have um, the, the other element, and, and you know, Matish uh, referred to this as kind of the pipeline or when we bring um, talent into the firm, I think, you know, where we have, has, what we have historically done is been pretty broad brush on kind of just getting, CVs in and then rushing through the process because I'm not sure if everyone knows is the interview process at Wellington is quite a long old process and it is it is takes up a lot of time and so I think we 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 have been much much more methodical about how we think about the the candidates the diverse slate of candidates right um, and I think that's taken up a, it's taken much more time than we expected um, and I think the role of line management, one thing that I've learned in the past year certainly is that you really, really need to hold the line on that, right? Um, I think it's because particularly for senior hires or more experienced hires because there is a network. Um, and so our existing analysts want to bring in, you know, tap into their network and everybody knows each other. And that kind of, you know, takes us away from what we're trying to do on our uh, DE and I objective. So I think, you know, one thing um, that, that we're much more conscious of is being really, really deliberate about looking at the candidate um, slate when we're, we're hiring for senior positions. One lesson I was going to share was really specifically around feedback. I know a couple of you have mentioned that already. Paul was talking about that earlier. Uh, I guess for me, it was really important up front that how do we create a culture where feedback can flow downwards and, you know, this idea of radical candor, care enough to tell people what you really think, but equally, you know, get it upwards and, and, and make sure that feedback is flowing upwards, which is so hard and slightly against our human instincts. Um, and I, if I've got to say, we, we failed at doing that at multiple, you know, we, we did a lot of training on radical candor, nothing really changed. We held workshops on it and nothing really changed. You know, we've we put it in people's objectives. We've got it in our manager criteria. But even then it was patchy as to how well people were giving tough feedback and how well they're, they're receiving it. The most recent iteration and effort at that has been to share feedback profiles. So what we've done starting from myself and my leadership team and the next in line is to say, we want your feedback. Here's how I best receive feedback on a scale of zero to 10 from sugarcoated to sledgehammer. Um, and then and then here's who I best receive feedback through and the format. And here are the specific things I would value feedback on. And we found that's been quite a valuable kind of opener to, to help people address this thing that sits in the a bit difficult, a bit awkward, you know, and, and, and a bit painful category. No one wants to do those things. So you've just got you've got to find ways of making it easier. Uh, and I'm hoping this latest effort in that attempt would will make it easier. 
in helping give feedback, not just upwards, but across as well. I think it's critical in creating inclusive cultures. That's a brilliant analogy, sugar-coated to sledgehammer. I will remember that. A really interesting question, which I think follows a, a, a bit from that, which is um, how do you counter the bias that comes in, in in promotions and so on? And clearly that's part of a pipeline issue, making sure diversity percolates. Um, and any thoughts, would anyone like to talk about that? Vanessa. Yes, yeah, I can I can add to that. So I, I think uh, when I when I talked about the the accountability and the ownership um, of the directors on, on the platform, when we look at um, the promotion candidates um, and, and succession planning as well, um, there there are to, to Paul's point, they're not quotas, but there are targets that we are accountable for to say. So here's our promotion um, uh, our promotion list. Um, and that, that list has to be diverse, however we want to define that um, at Wellington, and, and it varies by region, um, and, and also succession planning. I think succession planning is, um, you know, we spend a lot of time at Wellington on, on succession planning, as I'm sure um, uh, both Paula and Matesh do, and it's really, really important for us um, to get that right. But as we think about succession planning, um, it's the, the best talent we have is the internal talent that we have. Um, and I think this is, when we think about um, a, a, a PM, for example, retiring, um, you know, th there's a lot of work that goes into that five, seven years out um, to build the bench, the team, the talent, to have the skills and, and experience to be able to, firstly, the transition to be smooth, and secondly, ultimately, for the team to be successful. Um, and so I think when we, when we think about um, our internal talent and motivating that internal talent, it's, it's much more... Uh, it gives a much more sense of belonging um, to, to the individual talent if they are identified for that and we build their skills and we give them the resources. They might not have the skills now, but we see your potential. We're prepared to invest in you because this is where we want you um, to be. And so I think, um, Julia, it is about identifying the talent that we have internally before we go externally. And, you know, that's wrapped up in kind of the promotion process and kind of providing a, a career path for the, the talent that we already have. I, I guess the other thing which is really hard to get your arms around is, is where the different personalities come through. And maybe it's cultural, maybe it's just personality, but where some people are really pushy and kind of get what they want. Um, other people aren't, but should get what they aren't getting. And, and I don't know how one balances that. Uh, and, and, you know, it's all a bit human. I was going to say, and yeah, to, to this and your previous question, Julie, I was just going to say that we've, we've had a few iterations of our kind of promotion committee and our remuneration committee really in this context. And part of it is having a group of people there that are diverse themselves. So that's step one. <laughs> uh, step two is like any good governance, you shouldn't stop there. So yes, we will have the direct conversation with managers who are recommending pay or promotions or bonuses for their people, but we'll also have our people team offer an objective lens on is, so we'll, have, we'll be the first line where we'll challenge managers to say, are you just promoting someone who's shouting louder? Or can you show us what competencies are needed for this promotion and who is better placed at doing that? And actually, often that's helped us unearth this, this kind of bias that sits, um, you know, and actually that's true for female and male managers, for example, will both be seduced by the person who's shouting louder. <laughs> and so that's the first line of call. But the second one is really the people team who will look at our promotions, who will look at our decisions and say and challenge us and call out whether they believe there's been, you know, there's bias at play. Um, and where they think, at least help us uh, kind of identify and shine a light on where they think there's issues. So having a couple of levels to that all the way through to kind of for the ultimate senior ones to the board um, is really important. I don't think it can just be one person or one department's job. F fantastic. Paul, I don't know if you've got anything from your lens. Don't need to. Oh, I, th I think I think the guys have summed that up very well. I think you know, as we touched on before, there there is just a danger of people promoting their own image. There's also 
a danger of those who shout loudest get what they want. Um, unfortunately, however, I would say, and everyone on this call will know this, this is a, you know, we are all working in, in pretty competitive, high performing environments. And so um, there's, you know, there's, there's no way, there's no way around that. So, and that, that comes with a certain personality type that, 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 that is, you know, generally speaking more, you know, it, you do see time and time again with organizations, the people who are sort of bullish and in your face tend to advance, uh, you know, quicker and, and not necessarily always with merit. So I think the, the main thing though, is to recognize that there are different personalities at play and that every organization benefits from having different organizations up and down the entire structure. If everyone at the senior level is, is you know, sort of gung-ho in your face, you know, loud mouth types, then that's not going to work. Equally, if they're the opposite, that's not going to work either. And so for me, it's about role modeling and having people, uh, it, it's about being able, as a junior person, it's being able to look at someone uh, and it actually only needs to be one person uh, and saying, you know, I, I want to be like that, that woman or that man. Um, and I can imagine myself doing, you know, being, being like them in years to come. And I think, you know, it's slightly, slightly cheesy, but the, the phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it, I think really does apply to lots of people. And, and actually it doesn't, it's not necessarily, it, it applies to people who would not consider themselves to be diverse as well, because, you know, actually just, you know, just, just because you might happen to be from a more traditional background as such, you still need to be able to see someone ahead of you in the, in the line and say, actually, I could, I could be, I could be like that person. Um, and so I think role modeling is, it, you know, it, it is very important. And I think the people who are more introverted and COVID has shown this, right? So, so, you know, this, this, this pandemic has not been easy for anyone. It's not been easy for the introverts who have to get on a call with lots of, you know, get on a video call with lots of people and suddenly, you know, the camera's on them and they have to speak. It's equally not easy for the extroverts who, who live and thrive off the energy that the, you know, that the office can give them. And so you have to recognize you know, I think my my less my sort of takeaway is that you know one size fits all to to talent uh, development and retention. A one size fits all policy just does not work, and you have to you have to flex it for the particular individual, um, and maybe encourage the quieter people to be a bit more forthcoming and 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 a bit more vocal about their achievements and their ambitions, and the louder people to sort of tone it down a bit. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, thank you. And I, I'm conscious now that we should start wrapping up. I, I know there's one more question we've not answered, but maybe you could wrap it into this, which is the distinction between sponsorship and mentorship, um, which, which I'm not going to ask you to answer uh, now. But, but as we wrap up, um, could each of you give us your top tips, um, one to three, what you'd leave, like to leave the audience with as things that will really turn the dial. We've had a lot of ideas. You might want to repeat them if, if you wish. Who'd like to go first? Vanessa or, or Paul? Paul. No, I, I, I think I've just blown my one because I've, I've, I, I think I've just revealed <laughs> it already, but I'll, I'll just address, I'll, I'll, just, I'll address, while well, well, I'm in session Vanessa, think about that. I'll, I'll just address the final question, I think, which is- okay. You. you know, there, there is a place for mentorship as alongside sponsorship. To me, sponsorship mm -hmm. is the gold standard because it's someone who, as I said at the start, is really bending over backwards to, to bring, you know, to bring the, spons the sponsee through uh, what, what can be a quite a difficult path in terms of any organisation to, to advance their own career. And it's a much more, in my mind, proactive role. But having said that, you can't do that for everyone and therefore... Um, you know, being, you know, having mentors and having people outside of your, your department or your specialism and a mentor doesn't even have to be in your business and often all your industry, often you can learn a lot from people who are completely removed from that. And so, you know, if, if there are people on this call, you know, who are, uh, you know, a, 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 I'm sure senior people, the ability to sort of mentor the, or the offer of mentoring more junior people um, and giving your time. It can only be, it can be an hour, you know, an hour every three months, uh, you know, coffee here and there. That That is really, uh, really valuable. So I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Brilliant, thank you. Vanessa, yeah, my, you, your top tips. My top tips. Um, so I, I would say three tips. One is like, uh, 
don't try to boil the ocean. I was on a, on a call with an external consultant about this. And I think we, you know, with our DE and I initiatives, we, we all have the right intentions, but we're kind of trying to fix it all at once. And I think if we're really targeted on specific groups and or specific cohorts, like for example, you know, for our early career investor talent, we're going to focus on bringing this characteristic or this um, type of diverse um, cohort in. And then maybe for um, officership promotions, AVP, VP will focus on our female talent. And then over time, you, as you build the, the tiles in the mosaic, as we like to say, you end up having a, a broader um, impact. I think um, the second point I would say, and, and Paul alluded to this, is, is really need to customize. I think I think about my role as taking the firm's overarching policies, procedures, and, and processes and really customizing them to the individual level. And what I've thought about it in, in COVID is, you know, what does flexible working really look like for uh, uh, the in the traditional sense for a parent, but what does it look like for somebody that's a primary care of an older parent? What does flexible working look like for a cognitive diverse or an introverted or a neurodiverse type um, colleague? And so I think it's all, it's really about understanding each individual and implementing the firm's overarching policy. So I put that in the customization um, type box. And then Matesh touched on this as well. And I think it's really important to just provide that platform to have those awkward, uncomfortable conversations. There's an alphabet soup of terms around DE and I and, and much broader than that and everything that's happening broader in society over the past 12 months and I think you know th there is a fear that that people are getting left behind um, or, or, or what and you know the what about me conversation and that's okay to feel that way and and I think as, as, as role as line manager as managers you really have to role model that good behavior and you know to me it's about making room at the table it's not a zero-sum game um, just making more room at the table for, for everybody. Thank you. Um, Mitesh? I know we're out of time, Julius. I've put mine in the chat. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very much. This has been great. I was going to attempt to summarise, but actually I, 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 it's quite hard. I think open communication, making sure the criteria are clear, making sure that people management, line management has status and and acknowledged uh, and, and lastly diversity through the organization it's not just the line manager's responsibility it's everybody's responsibility um i've i've learned an enormous amount i hope everybody else feels that they have to and thank you to our participants for for, for joining as well um and you know I'll, I'll i'll round off now but but thanks to the panel Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jane and Julia. Um, Thank you. I encourage everyone to read your paper and, and, <laughs> and use it with their leaders. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.